Okay, so I haven't done an update video here in a few days, so I thought I'd uh, do a quick one. So as you can see, um, supply header is done. Um, basically what I did was I dry fit it all in um, without these two pumps here. Um, just got the flanges where I wanted them. Dry fit everything and then broke it all down, took it all apart, cleaned everything, fluxed it rebuilt the whole thing um, and got it all got it all uh, put it all soldered in um, then I went ahead and added the pumps and I have all of the rest of my supply piping cut and installed for the concrete slabs down here uh, the return is done that's been done for a little while so yeah, everything is soldered pretty much up to here on the supplies. This the snow melt's totally done, um, and then everything from here down on these two is done. Um, I'm gonna hopefully take this back apart, flux it, and solder it today. So that whole zone is done, and then all I have left the return on on this one is done. This is my staple up radiant. Um, I'll just have to do the supply, which will come over above this here and come over and down and hit these two and then the return um, all I have to do here pretty much is figure out my lengths to come up to a 45 and into here for the return I'll have an air vent on that return um, I'll also have air vents on the supplies so each return 90 will have an air vent and uh, each supply 90 up at the top will have an air vent just to help when it's in bypass mode you know keep that it keep, keep the air out of the system so yeah that's uh that's where i'm at um so this is where it was stopped before this is my hot it basically comes out as you can see the radiant out comes out of the heat exchanger here comes down hits my pressure relief valve okay comes over spire vent and then it it will go over to uh, expansion tank I, I ended up getting rid of this one it was too small for the system or I think it's going to be too small and I don't want to risk it so um, I ended up purchasing the, uh, the bigger one which unfortunately is not going to fit here so I'm gonna pull this bracket off and I also had an EX30, and what I really need was an RX model, because I am going to have glycol in this. So, probably come down out of here within a couple of valves. Um, I'll probably just use like a stainless braided hose to go over to the uh, to the tank, and I'll do some shutoffs. And, and it's kind of a better thing, because the way I had this before, I really didn't have a way to isolate the expansion tank. So... If it failed, I mean, I could shut it off here, but I'm draining glycol and having to re-purge and all of that, whereas now I can just shut it off with a valve, change a tank, fill it back up, good to go. So anyway, uh, this, the supply comes down here. Um, it'll be, this valve will be open during normal operation, so it comes down behind here. And I have another fill purge valve. So there's one on each side of the of that shutoff. So I can fill and purge right from here. But this used to stop here and uh, now it comes up. And again, I got all this soldered. Um, I put a temperature and pressure gauge in here just so I can tell what the supply temperature is that's actually getting to the manifolds and what my pressure is on the on the heating side of things. Um, I really don't have a pressure gauge anywhere on the heating side. Um, I've, I've got a bunch of them on the domestic side to tell what the pressure is, but I wanted one on the heating side so I can get it up to, you know, 15 pounds when I fill it and make sure it doesn't go over 30 and everything else. So put that right there. Um, comes up, this is all inch and a half turns steps down to one inch this will be my staple up zone goes through a one-way check valve um, which probably didn't need these but i had already purchased them um and i figured you know I'll, I'll put them in and at least when this is bypassing it won't let anything 
go back down because right now when when these do not have power they're automatically they default to bypass mode so if i were to fire this up right now if it was done it's not going to let any fluid in or out of the zone because this valve is is closed so you know when it's closed it really shouldn't have anything coming in but this kind of just prevents you know it, it prevents anything from uh going that way in case one of the other ones is calling or something i didn't want it you know creating problems so um put it in and yeah so all three of those this is my radiant heat or i'm sorry my concrete slabs zone and these two like i mentioned in other videos these will be on continuous circulation so these will always be running in the winter when the system's on and I'll just set the delta T on the pumps and I'll let these aquastats back here control when to open the valve and turn on the primary loop pump. So whenever any one of these zones needs heat um, because of my set point and differential on the aquastat, it will energize, which when you apply power to the Belimos, they open so they will no longer let any fluid go into the bypass they will make it go down into the heat exchanger out the heat exchanger back up pick up heat and deliver it and you know these units are set at 140 so we'll see that's a hundred plate heat exchanger in there um i'm hoping to at least get 120 you know out of the uh across that plate with the losses and everything. So if I can get 120 degree glycol making it to these zones, um, you know, that, that's, that's perfect. I'm in good shape. And that will go up through the floors, through the slabs or into the driveway and then back. And once that return temperature gets up to where it's satisfied, the Aquastat will turn off, the primary pump will turn off and the Belimo will go back into bypass mode. So, as long as I have the snow melt on, the switch on, this pump will be on all the time. And this is the zone pump. So this will just circulate, circulate, circulate. And as it loses temperature, the aquastat will sense that. It'll come back on. It'll just, you know, basically a hands-off type system. And it's all adjustable based on the temperature of that aquastat. These, same thing, as long as it's winter and I have the radiant switch on, which I'll probably pretty much leave this on all winter, um, unless it gets really warm or we just don't want the floors warm. But uh, yeah, these will be on. Now these are nice because they're um, ECM pumps, so very energy efficient and I can set the Delta T. So what they'll do is they'll speed up to try and maintain that delta t so i'll put them in delta t mode probably start since it is well the the, the staple up i'll probably start maybe 10 degrees and the slabs maybe 20 um as a differential and then we'll see if it's if it's short cycling if it's causing this thing to run all the time then maybe i'll back it off or, or increase it you know increase the differential a little bit but i also want to see how the floors feel in the house so yeah so how that'll work is really they don't care what the temperature is um they are just looking at delta t so if the aquastat determines that the zone needs heat and it goes ahead and opens the belimo valve and turns on the pump it's going to start getting heat so what's going to happen is this pump is going to sense that the incoming water has now increased from whatever it was, say 90 degrees, now it's got 120 coming in, so the pump's gonna speed up to try and keep that 10 degree differential between the supply and the return. So the pump will speed up, speed up, speed up until it gets within 10 and it'll start to slow down. And in the meantime, once the return comes back, the Aquastat will sense that, it will close the Belimo and now that very slowly as the room as the house as the garage as the radiant snow melt whatever it is not the snow melt because those don't have ecms but as the house starts to lose heat the temperature will slowly drop 
and the pump will slowly slow down to keep that 10 degree differential. So we'll see how it all works out. It should be pretty efficient. Um, but yeah, and, and the nice thing is there's a lot of adjustability here. You know, I can play with the differential on these. I can play with the differential on the aquastats. I can adjust the temperature on the aquastats. Um, I can't really control the temperature. You know, the one thing I I could, but I don't want to, is the supply temperature coming in. That's going to pretty much be set at whatever it gets from this primary loop with these at 140. Now, I could turn the temperature down on the tank with units just something lower but then my domestic tank is not where I want it I want that tank at at least 130 degrees for Legionella um, I don't want to risk any growth or anything in that stainless tank so you know plus I've got I seem to have the domestic side right now dialed in where it works perfectly the temperatures are good the recirc is good like everything works great and it's only running you know, less than a dozen times a day, pretty much. And that's with all of our showers, dishwashing, dishwasher, you know, the two kids, everything. It, when I go back and look at the logs for when this runs, it's running, you know, I think on average 10 to 12 times a day for three minutes each. So, you know, do the math, 40 minutes, you know, 50 minutes out of 24 hours, you know that's considering you're in the shower how long you know what i mean it's really not bad um and it it works so i don't know that i want to mess with the temperatures on these i could so what i'm saying is there was really no way to put a three-way mixing valve in or temper the the temperature down to these zones so they're going to get whatever they get whether it's 120 130 it's going to be up to the return temperature in these aquastats to kind of dial it in which I'm pretty sure I can do uh, fairly easily so yeah as far as plumbing goes um, handful of joints left to solder you know two four six there and then two four six you know I probably have a couple dozen joints left one inch and I'm done soldering in this project and man what a what a journey it's been so yeah, anyway, um, then it's on to electrical. Um, so what I'm going to do there is obviously I have the aquastats and I mounted them before I put the supply uh, header in because it figured it'd be easier. So these aquastats all have a probe, okay, and that will run up and be on the return up here of that zone. Also, right in the same spot, there's a probe from this pump that will be you know next to it I'll probably put them on the pipe opposite each other but I'd like them to be pretty close on the pipe so they're reading at the same point so um, these two zones will get probes for the pump on the return and then they will get pro uh, probes on the supply so they're sensing supply temperature and they're sensing uh, return I probably could even put them down here if I wanted to um, you know supply supply it doesn't matter but uh, yeah either way so yeah each of those aquastats I'm gonna do that what I what I normally do or at least what I did with the sensor for the um, for the research aquastat down there is I use that aluminum foil tape and I taped it to the pipe and made sure it had really good contact and that seemed to make it very accurate and then I zip tied it down so it was tight and then I put insulation over it as well so I'll probably do the same treatment here with these two and um, you know try and get the most accurate reading that I can for these but uh, yeah, so the Belimo valves will all wire right into the aquastats. These pumps will all be hardwired so they're on all the time whenever power is received. And it's just going to be some wiring here. Um, what I'm probably going to do is mount a box here, 10 by 12 box that I can put my relays in and all of that. And then I'll have everything, you know, the power from the radiant, the power from the snow melt, I'll have those feed into that box. And then I'll have everything come out of that box and 
go where it needs to go. So yeah, um, I'm also thinking running some other ideas too about maybe putting a timer in. We'll see that box that maybe says whenever this system is already on, if it's already been on for a little bit, a couple of minutes so that it's all evened out, you know, maybe go ahead and turn on that pump just to keep the tank hot. I don't know yet. I want to, I want to play with that idea, but I think that would stop it from, you know, the units just being on for heating and then turning off and then all of a sudden the tank needs, so they refire. And, you know, if they're on anyway and they're running anyway and they're up to temperature, I really think it would take an extra two minutes. Obviously, it takes three minutes to circulate that tank. You know, I don't think it would be a heavy lift at all for this system to just go ahead and turn that pump on for a couple minutes and keep that tank topped off. Um, and I can do that with some delay on, delay off relays in the box. So I'll put everything over there. That way I have room, I have access to it, and I'll figure out, you know, how I want to run it back there. Probably just, probably just tack it all to the wall like this, do something nice. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what we're looking at. And then after that, it will pretty much be time to fill it. Um, I have one more loop for the snow melt that goes under the front porch that I still have to run and that goes through the basement and up to the front of the house. So I have to decide if I want to do that now and just get it up there or if I just want to put some pipe in here and get this capped off and uh, just so I can get this running this winter. So. Yeah, um, once I do that, I, I would like to put air on it. So what I think I'm probably gonna do is finish my soldering, figure out what I wanna do with, with that loop so that the whole thing should be airtight. And then I'm probably gonna put the whole thing under air pressure. I'll have to cap the spiral vent, but I wanna put the whole thing under 30 pounds or less. I don't want it to blow that relief valve, but I want to see if it'll hold air. I want to see if, if I can easily fix or find a leak, which I don't think I have any because I mean, I, I really took my time soldering these and tried to, to do them well. But, um, if I have a leak that I could easily fix before I have glycol in there, man, that would be nice. Uh, the domestic side, you know, I had leaks. A lot of the leaks I had on the domestic side were some of the soldering I had done early on. I feel like I'm getting better at it. I've done enough of it, obviously, so hopefully none of this leaks. But the domestic, you know, a little water leaked out, who cares? You know, you drain it into the sump pit and you just start over. The glycol, that's that's a, that's different. That's a bigger, you know, pain. Number one, it's expensive. I really don't want, you know, $70 for five gallons of glycol pouring all over the floor and you know that's a mess and then number two when I do have to drain it down it's not as easy I have to contain it I have to catch it I have to recirculate it I have to pump it back in it's just it's not as easy as the domestic side so if I could catch a small little pinhole leak or something with air before I uh, put the actual glycol in it I think that's the way to go so yeah, hopefully today I get the rest of this soldering done and then uh, we'll move on to the next step, probably that loop. And then I can fill it with air and uh, go from there, start working on the electrical. So yeah, we're getting really close here. I'll, uh, I'll bring you guys back and keep you updated as I, as I keep going. Thanks for watching.